While patients and physicians shout loudly that Lyme disease is chronic and persistent, there is a core group of research scientists with ties to public health and industry who claim patients and their physicians are delusional, or that patients spend too much time on the Internet researching their ills. But many registered patent inventions under oath stand clearly in opposition to those who claim there are, quote, self-proclaimed Lyme literati that have used misinterpretations, misrepresentations, and bold fabrications to promote their ill-conceived and self-serving agenda regarding diagnosis and treatment, end quote. This statement comes from a website that is currently promoting a new medical textbook written in part by doctors Jorge Banach, Ira Schwartz, Tom G. Schwann, Errol Fickrig, Alan G. Barber, Stephen W. Barthold, Linda K. Bockenstead, Gary P. Wormser, and Raymond J. Datweiler. These individuals are among academicians who are sympathetic to the IDSA guidelines author's consensus viewpoint and who individually or collectively may be among those who are promoting the idea that Lyme disease is not a chronic infection. Three of the source book authors were co-authors of the controversial IDSA guidelines for Lyme disease. One is listed as inventor on approximately 100 patents for Borrelia, and several were present at the Dearborn Conference, a CDC-sponsored event I will discuss further in the next section. At least three of these individuals were involved in the identification of the causative agent of Lyme disease and yet from the text of a patent application for a Lyme vaccine that lists Raymond Datweiler and Benjamin Luft as inventors, we read, quote, currently Lyme disease is treated with antibiotics, however such treatment is not always successful in clearing the infection. Treatment is often delayed due to improper diagnosis with the deleterious effect that the infection proceeds to a chronic condition where treatment with antibiotics is often not useful. One of the factors contributing to delayed treatment is the lack of effective diagnostic tools, end quote. Doctors Datweiler and Luft were part of the Dearborn Conference Planning Committee where CDC standardized diagnostic tests were established. Tests that Datweiler's new patent application refers to as ineffective. The truth about the serious nature of Lyme disease is also revealed in the text of another Lyme disease vaccine patent. Quote, in the majority of cases, Lyme disease can be successfully treated with antibiotics. However, even with such treatment, a number of cases will nevertheless proceed to chronic infection. At least 25% of the chronic disease does not elicit the characteristic ECM response, which means that a substantial proportion of chronic disease cases are presented to the clinician as advanced stages of the disease. In addition, approximately 1% of chronic disease patients either escape early stage detection or fail to respond to antibiotic therapy and consequently contract chronic Lyme disease. Therefore, in a sizable number of instances, infection results in the development of debilitating late-stage or chronic Lyme disease, end quote. Although I would say this 1% is an extremely conservative estimate, nevertheless, the patent emphasizes both the chronic nature of the disease and the idea that after antibiotic treatments, patients can remain ill. This is hardly delusional, self-serving, a bold fabrication, or even evidence of an Internet virus. Indeed, it would seem that those who promote the party line that BB is not a complex persisting infection have banded together in a last-ditch effort to spin the story of Lyme disease according to their beliefs, which they may certainly do if they so desire. Scientific consensus is a beautiful thing, especially since it helps attract federal research dollars for unknown illnesses, while those who question consensus remain unfunded. However, this consensus does not guarantee that the story being presented by conceding scientists is entirely accurate or that it is supported by a large body of research written by independent scientists who are outside of the core group. As we will learn, there are many instances where chronic, persistent Lyme disease is openly acknowledged, sometimes even by an academic scientist who was present at the origins of the Connecticut outbreak. This same scientist also cultured a patient's EM rash to find a surprising new spirochete that has never been openly and freely discussed, at least not until now.
It has been the experience of many Lyme patients that physicians who follow the recommendations of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases or ILADS camp of clinical physicians endow patients with the ability to fare significantly better in treatment than those whose physicians follow the more restrictive IDSA guidelines for Lyme disease. Nevertheless, it is the infectious disease researchers whose ties and influence to industry and public health have gained a firm grasp on Lyme disease definitions and diagnostic and treatment options. This unilateral hold on one interpretation of a medical ill has led to global problems for infected patients who remain undiagnosed, untreated, or are undertreated as a consequence of following what have been called overly restrictive medical guidelines for Lyme disease. The divisional bias between treatment philosophies for Lyme disease has left a large number of lives broken and disillusioned due to the IDSA guidelines brand of evidence-based and managed care medicine and because of the Centers for Disease Control CDC 1994 standardization of Lyme disease diagnostic tests. As a result, the public also suffers from medical insurers who are content to collect premiums without providing benefits while illnesses are denied based on evidence-based medicine that is defined by those with industry ties and possible private agendas. The idea that insurance companies are heavily invested in biotech companies that might be contributing to the diseases for which subscribers are requesting benefits does not escape the most savvy observers. In what other disease category do we find patients literally forced to end treatments after only a month or two because some public health authorities suggest that an illness should be cured in that period of time? Patients with less physically devastating problems, including chronic acne, are allowed more potent antibiotics for indefinite periods of time, while patients with debilitating and sometimes deadly tick-borne infections are entirely dismissed, denied, and at times even ridiculed by members of the scientific community and the media. In 1975, 59 cases of Lyme disease were reported in Connecticut. A decade later, that number had reached 863, according to a source. As the story about the origins of Lyme disease is told by Dr. Banach et al. in one book, there appears to be no mention of Dr. Alan Steer et al.'s culturing of a Lyme patient's EM rash, his discovery of a new spirochete, or the efforts by Dr. Alan Barber to modify a medium to improve the culturing of spirochetes. The significance of each of these events will be explored in an upcoming chapter. Reported case numbers published by the CDC for Lyme disease have changed very little over the past dozen years. I find the statistics conflicting and confusing when I compare data that is reported by scientists to CDC reported case numbers. As an example, in your supplement we will see a map to illustrate the suggested prevalence of Lyme disease in the U.S. according to scientific researchers. According to a text, by 1987, cases of Lyme disease were farther reaching than what the CDC was publicly reporting at that time. As described by the chapter's authors, Gail S. Habicht, Gregory Beck, and Jorge L. Banach, the following states had reported cases of Lyme disease to the CDC. Minnesota, Texas, Wisconsin, North Atlantic coastal states from Massachusetts to North Carolina, and Pacific coastal states of California and Oregon. Scattered cases were reported in Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Kentucky, Maine, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, New Hampshire, Ohio, Tennessee, Utah, and Vermont. According to a source, as of 1990, the authors of this chapter were affiliated with the Department of Pathology at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Dr. Jorge Banach was among a handful of co-authors with Dr. Willy Bergdorfer in 1982 who announced the discovery of the causative agent of Lyme disease. Please review your supplement book for the maps of which I am speaking. In the supplement we also examine a map of reported Lyme cases published by the CDC from 1982 to 1998. Note the areas of the country reporting heavy case numbers appear fewer than are described in the 1987 source. It would appear from the CDC maps that Lyme case numbers were on the decline over previous years. The number of unreported but suspected cases rose in clinics across the country while the numbers reported by the CDC were far fewer in number. 
By 2005, the number of CDC-reported Lyme disease cases had not changed substantially over the previous two decades, according to their maps. Yet suspected cases of Lyme disease grew exponentially as reported by literature and anecdotal accounts. We might question the CDC surveillance case reporting system or the methods used by doctors to diagnose the disease for this discrepancy. Regardless of maps, by 2005, Lyme had been reported in nearly all states, in Canada, and in all other populated continents around the globe. By September 2010, Lyme disease had been reported in all 50 U.S. states, and yet updated surveillance case maps and numbers were unavailable on the CDC website until late September 2010. Once revealed, the 2009 updated case map appeared identical to the case map from 2005. I have examples of both of these maps in your supplement. The 2008 CDC case numbers were 38,000. In 2009, they were 35,000 with a growth rate of only 8.26% for confirmed cases. People have asked if a failure to stay on top of Lyme disease surveillance cases is evidence of a slow-played epidemic or simply a refusal to believe there is a problem by public health experts.